Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hello everyone, how are you? Hope you are good. I am Mr. Wayne and today we will have a revision on uh, uh, the, the lessons that we studied on the first term. Okay, let's start. Uh, if you remember, in uh, the first term, we studied three units. Unit one is talking about the elements classification and the attempts of scientists to classify the elements. In unit two, we uh, talked about the atmospheric layers and erosion of ozone layer, the uh, greenhouses and its effect. Uh, okay, and in unit three, we talked about the fossils and types of fossils and also the extinction and what are the extinct animals and the endangered animals. Okay, so today we will have a revision or we will summarize up together uh, what we studied in the first term. Let's start. Okay, firstly, the attempts of the elements classification. We know that the scientists try to classify the elements, so we have uh, three scientists try to classify the elements. The first scientist is Mendeleev. Mendeleev tried to arrange the elements according to their atomic weight. So the elements were discovered in the time of Mendeleev are SCST-7 elements. So he tried to arrange SCST-7 elements in ascending order according to their atomic weight. Okay. Uh, while he's uh, trying to arrange the elements, uh, there are some advantage and disadvantage for his periodic table. So let's see the advantage and disadvantages of Mendeleev's periodic table. Firstly, the advantages of, uh, of Mendeleev's periodic table. Number one, he left gaps for the discovery of the new elements. Mendeleev predicted that uh, the elements that will come after him will discover a new elements. So he left some gaps in his periodic table for the discovery of these new elements. Two, he corrected the atomic weights or wrong atomic weights of some elements. Okay, here is the advantages of Mendeleev's periodic table. Two, disadvantages of Mendeleev's periodic table. Number one, he made a disturbance in the ascending order of the atomic weights of some elements. Mendeleev tried to uh, classify uh, the elements according to their properties. So while classifying these elements, he make a disturbance in the ascending order of the elements. Two, he had to deal with the isotopes of one element as a different element. Okay, so here is Mendeleev's periodic table. Two, Mosley's periodic table. The second scientist that we will study or that we will study his periodic table is Mosley. Mosley's periodic table. Mosley uh, tried to arrange the elements in his periodic table according to their atomic number, not atomic weight like Mendeleev. So uh, he arranged the elements, as we say, according to their atomic number. And uh, about the modifications that he added to his periodic table is, number one, he added zero group or group 18. Okay, which contain the noble gases or the inert gases. Two, he specified a place below his table for the elements of lanthanides and actinides. So, again, mostly, mostly in his periodic table or the modification that he, uh, uh, that happens to the periodic table uh, for mostly is adding zero group, which contains the inert gases and uh, specifying a place uh, for the elements of lanthanides and actinides. Okay, Bohr's periodic table. The last scientist uh, that tried to put a periodic table is Bohr. Bohr discovered that the atom contains seven energy levels and he put the modern periodic table. Okay, the elements in the modern periodic table are classified according to number one, their atomic number, not atomic weight like Mendeleev uh, done uh, or do. And uh, number two, the way of filling of the energy sublevels with electrons. Okay, so again, uh, the elements that uh, found in the modern periodic table are classified according to number one, their atomic number, and number two, the way of filling of the energy sublevels with electrons. Rutherford, who is Rutherford and what he do? Rutherford discovered that the atom contains, uh, uh, or the nucleus of the atom contains, a positively charged protons. That's all that Rutherford do. Okay, the modern periodic table. The modern periodic table consists of seven horizontal periods and 18 vertical group. Okay, so these elements are classified or they are arranged in the modern periodic table in four blocks. The first block is S block. Second one is B block and then D block and F block. 
The first block, which is S block, it's located or it's found in the modern periodic table in the left side. Okay, it's located in the left side of the periodic table. And it contains two groups, group 1A and group 2A. The second block, it's called B block. B block found in the right side of the periodic table and it contains six groups, starting from 3A till group 0 or group 18, which contains the inert gases. So it's starting from, it's starting from 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, and 0. D block. D block located in the middle of the periodic table and it uh, consists of eight groups starting from 3B till 2B. So 3B, 4B, 5B, 6B, 7B. Then we have three columns uh, called the group 8 and then 1B and 2B. So they are 10 groups, okay, or uh, they are eight groups, okay. And the elements, the elements for a D block are called transitional elements. Okay, and these elements starting from period four. The last block, which is F block. F block, uh, it is located below the periodic table and it includes lanthanides and actinides. Okay, so here is about the periodic table. Let's now see the properties of the elements in the periodic table. We say before that uh, the elements are arranged in the periodic table uh, in periods and the groups. Okay, so the elements that lie in the same period will have a properties and also the elements with li which lie in uh, the same group will have a, proper a properties. Let's see the properties the, uh, of the elements that lie in the same period. That lie in the same period. So, the elements that lie in the same period, okay, as we go from left to right in the period, the atomic size will decrease and the electronegativity will increase. And the metallic property well decreases and also non-metallic property well increases okay that's about the elements that lie in the same period the elements which lie in the same group the element which lie in the same group as we go from up to down okay so the atomic size well decreases electronegativity well increases metallic property well increases and non-metallic property well decreases okay so here is about the properties of the elements in the modern periodic table. Let's now see about the chemical properties of the elements. Firstly, some elements can react with diluted acids, forming salt of acid and hydrogen gas. Let's see an example. For example, magnesium or Mg. Magnesium is a metal. When it reacts with diluted hydrochloric acid, which is HCl, it will form magnesium chloride or a salt of the acid and the hydrogen gas that uh, evolves okay two the metals can also react with oxygen forming a metallic oxide or that uh, what we can call basic oxide let's see an example when magnesium reacts with oxygen it will form magnesium oxide which is a basic oxide number three when the basic oxide reacts or it dissolves in water, it will form an alkali or alkaline solution. Let's see the example. When magnesium oxide reacts with water, it will form magnesium hydroxide, okay, which has a blue color. Okay, so here is the chemical properties of the metals. Let's see the chemical properties of non-metals. The non-metals doesn't react or it didn't react with uh, the acids. Okay, that's the first uh, point. Point number two. The non-metals can react with oxygen forming a non-metallic oxide or that we can call acidic oxides. So, for example, uh, carbon, when it reacts with oxygen, it will form carbon dioxide. And point number three. When a non-metal oxide dissolves in water, it will form an acid. Okay, for example, when carbon dioxide reacts with water, it will form, it will form carbonic acid okay so here's about the chemical properties of non-metals the chemical activity series what is the chemical activity series chemical activity series is the arrangement of the metals in descending order according to their chemical activity so in the chemical activity series the metals are arranged in this a series or in this uh, group according to uh, their activity okay 
So, potassium and sodium. Potassium and sodium reacts instantly with water, or they are very active metals. So, when it's uh, or once it reacts with water, or once it uh, exposed to the water, it will react. Okay, and it will form hydrogen gas. So, hydrogen gas evolved. Calcium and magnesium. Calcium and magnesium reacts slowly with cold water. Okay. Zinc and iron. Zinc and iron reacts at high temperature or the hot water vapor. Okay. Zinc and silver. Zinc and silver didn't react or it, it doesn't react with water. Okay. So again, the chemical activity series or the metals that found in the chemical activity series, they are the arrangement of the metals in the sending order according to their chemical activity. Okay. So sodium and potassium are the most active elements in the series. Okay. Let's now see or let's talk about the main groups in the modern periodic table. What are the main groups in the modern periodic table? We have three groups. Number one, the alkali metals. Number two, the halogens. And number three, energy gases or group zero. Okay, let's firstly talk about the first group, which is the alkali metals or group 1A. Group 1A, as we know, and as we say before, it lies in S block, okay, at the left of the periodic table. And uh, as we say before, in its uh, properties, it can react with the water to form alkaline solution or alkali solutions. Like when sodium reacts with water, it will form sodium hydroxide and the hydrogen gas uh, evolves. Okay, here is about the alkali metals or uh, um, a points for the alkali metals. Uh, okay, the alkali metals or the uh, al all the alkali metals are monovalent elements. They are monovalent elements, which means they have uh, only one electron in their outermost energy level. Okay, and they tend to lose electrons. They tend to lose electron to form a positive ion. Okay, uh, their activity. They are chemically active elements. So, they kept under kerosene surface or paraffin surface to prevent the reaction with the moist air. Okay. Their chemical activity, we say before, they are very active metals. Okay. And the most active element is a cesium element. Uh, here is about the, their chemical properties. Let's see their physical properties. They are good conductors of heat and electricity. These elements, or the alkali metals, are good conductor of heat and electricity. And they are, or they have low density. Okay, so here is about the alkali metals and their properties. Now let's see the second group, which is halogens, or group 7A. Group 7A lies in B block, in the uh, right side of the periodic table. And they can form salt. Uh, they can form uh, a salt because they react with the metals to form a salt. For example, the calcium. Uh, sorry, potassium. When it reacts with bromine, it can form potassium bromide. So here is a metal which is potassium, a non-metal which is bromine. When they react together, they will form a salt called potassium bromide. Okay. Let's see their chemical properties. Number one, they are monovalent. They have uh, uh, electrons or they tend to gain electrons, okay, to form a negative ion, so they are monovalent. Uh, they exist in the diatomic molecules, so we can write Cl2, Br2, uh, I2, okay, they are, they are diatomic molecules. Their activity, they are chemically active elements, so they exist in chemical compounds except a statin element. A statin prepared artificially in the lab. Okay. Uh, what else? And uh, the, this elements uh, or the elements in this groups replaces the elements below it in their solution. It replaces it in their solution. So for example, if we have uh, potassium bromide when it reacts with the chlorine, so the chlorine will replace the bromine element in its salt solution. Okay, because it's more active than it. Okay, 
about their physical properties, the chlorine and the fluorine uh, they uh, found in uh, their gaseous state, while bromine found in liquid state and solid state like iodine. Okay. And all of these elements are bad conductors of heat and electricity. Here is about the halogens or group 7A. The last group, which is inert gases or group 0, they are the last group in the periodic table and they lie in the B block at the right side. Okay, the right side of the periodic table. All of these elements, all of these elements, uh, the inert gases lie or they are found in their gaseous state and they are chemically inactive. What is the meaning of their, uh, they are chemically inactive? They um, can't react or they don't share in chemical reaction as their outermost energy level completely filled with electrons. Okay, and they are monoatomic uh, molecules. Here is about the periodic table or the main groups that found in the modern periodic table. Okay, it's complete. The properties of the elements and their uses. We will study uh, where we studied, we already studied this elements and the uses of these elements. Number one, the sodium element. We can use sodium element in its liquid state for transferring of the heat inside the nuclear reactors. Okay. The silicon. We can use silicon to make or for the manufacture of computers because they are semiconductors. Three, liquefied nitrogen. We can use liquefied nitrogen in preserving the icornia. Okay, because it has low melting point. And if you remember, the melting point of liquefied nitrogen is negative 196 degree. Okay, radioact radioactive uh, cobalt 60. We can use this element in preservation of food because it emits gamma rays. It emits rays called gamma rays, which uh, prevent the reproduction of microbes on the food. So it's used in food preservation. Okay. The uh, water. Lesson four was talking about water. Uh, do you remember the structure of water? Water is written like that, or its chemical structure is H2O. So it's formed of one oxygen atom and two hydrogen atom. Okay, and they are uh, combined together by a single covalent bond. And the atom, or sorry, the angle between uh, hydrogen and oxygen is 104.5 degree. Okay, the properties of the water. We have physical properties of water and also chemical properties. What are the physical properties of water? Number one, it exists in three states, which are solid liquid and gas two they are good polar solvent so they dissolve uh, most of the ionic uh, ionic and the covalent compound ionic compounds like the sodium chloride and covalent compound like uh, the sugar okay it can form a hydrogen bond with this uh, molecules so it is a good polar solvent three it is uh, the pure water the pure water boils at 100 degree and freezes at zero degree okay it's density it's density decreases on freezing so the density of ice is less than the density of water okay here is about the physical properties of water let's see now the chemical properties of water number one water has neutral effect on the litmus paper so it doesn't affect on the litmus paper okay it has a neutral effect two Water electrolysis. We can use a device which is called Hofmann's voltameter. Hofmann's voltameter is a device that we can use to make electrolysis for the water. The acidified water, not the pure water. Okay. So uh, we can make uh, water electrolysis by using the electricity. Okay, for the acidified uh, water, and it will decompose into oxygen and hydrogen. We will found that. Uh, oxygen collected at the anode and uh, hydrogen will collect it at cathode. Okay. It is about the properties of water, the chemical and the physical properties for the water. 
Now the water pollution. There are many substances that we can find in the water, like the wastes of the animals, like the chemical pollutants, like fuel and like uh, the, the uh, liquids that emitted from the factories. All of these things can make pollution for the water or it can affect on the living organism and living creatures that found in water and that will harm them. Okay, so let's talk about the additions or the harmful additions that can be added to the water to make pollution for it. Firstly, the biological pollution. Biological pollution occurs due to getting rid of the human and animal wastes in the water sources like rivers and lakes and so on, all the water resources. Okay, so it is called type uh, of a water pollution called biological pollution. And the diseases that caused by this uh, type of pollution is Harizia, typhoid, and hepatitis. They are types of diseases that cause due to the biological pollution that causes due to getting rid of the human and animal wastes in the water resources. The second type of pollution is chemical pollution. Chemical pollution caused by the factories, caused by the factors, the liquid and the fuel and all the chemicals that uh, found in the water or the factors get rid of these chemicals in the waters so in the water resources uh, so they uh, destroy all the marine life and uh, uh, cause death for all the living creatures in the water okay for from the chemicals that we can found in the water is lead the lead can cause uh, damage for the human brain cells mercury mercury can cause blindness Arsenic and the arsenic causes liver cancer. Okay, so here is about the chemical pollution. The radioactive materials, the radioactive materials uh, uh, like uh, the cobalt 60 that we talked about from a while. All the radioactive elements or the radioactive materials that found in the water will cause this pollution and uh, damage for all the marine creatures and marine life under the water. Okay. And that makes uh, the, the ground and the water contaminated. Okay. Thermal pollution. What about the thermal pollution? Thermal pollution resulted from the nuclear reactors. It resulted from the nuclear reactors. That uh, uh, the nuclear reactors use the water uh, from the nearby rivers to absorb the heat that result from, uh, during uh, their work. So the hot water is returned back to the river and the heat reduces the amount of oxygen dissolved in the water and it causes the death of the marine organisms. Okay, so here is about water pollution. Let's complete. Reducing water pollution. How can we reduce water pollution? Okay, number one. The sewage is treated before being thrown in the water resources. It is the first way we can treat the sewage before throwing it. Two, a chemical analysis of the contents and the quality of the water is done periodically. We can make a, a, a chemical analysis for the water. Three, the media should inform the people about reducing pollution. The awareness, the uh, awareness by the media, it should be done for the pollution, at, to all the types of pollution, not only the water pollution. Four, uh, uh, disinfecting water tanks periodically. We can uh, make uh, uh, like um, sterilizing for the water tanks periodically or from time to time to uh, make the water healthy for to to be to be drinked. And five, don't put the tap water in the plastic bottles. Okay. Okay, let's complete. Okay, so here's all that we talked about in uh, unit one. Let's now talk about unit two, which is talking about the atmospheric layers and uh, the uh, things that can happen in the space like the erosion of ozone layer and uh, the greenhouses effect. Firstly, the atmospheric envelope. What is the atmospheric envelope? The atmospheric envelope is a gaseous envelope that rotates around the earth and uh, around its axis and it extends to 1000 kilometers above the sea. Okay, atmospheric pressure. What is atmospheric pressure? It is the height uh, or sorry, it is the weight of air column of an atmospheric height on a unit area. 
okay? And it can be measured by bar or millibar. The normal atmospheric pressure, what is the normal atmospheric pressure? It is the atmospheric pressure at sea level and it equals to 1013.25 millibar. Okay, we have an instrument that we can use uh, uh, to um, measure the atmospheric pressure like aneroid and altimeter. The aneroid can determine the possible day weather and altimeter measure the elevation from the sea level. Okay, isobar, what is isobar? Isobar or curved lines, the joints between the uh, equal pressure in atmospheric pressure map. Okay, here is the first part. Now let's see the atmospheric envelope layers. We have four layers, troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, and thermosphere. The first layer, let's see the first layer, which is troposphere. Okay, let's see the uh, troposphere. Okay, let's see again the first layer, which is troposphere layer. Its thickness. Its thickness is uh, 13 kilometers. Uh, next, uh, the height. Its height from sea level is, uh, is uh, 13 kilometers. The temperature. The temperature at its top is negative 60 degree. The atmospheric pressure, atmospheric pressure is 100 millibar. Okay, the characters or the importance of this layer, it is called the disturbed layer because all the turb turbulence occur uh, in this layer, like the clouds, like rains, uh, all of the turbulence of the weather occur uh, in this layer. Okay, it contains about 75% of the mass of the atmospheric air. Okay, and 99% of the atmospheric water vapor. Okay, so here is about the first layer, which is troposphere layer. The second layer, stratosphere, its thickness, it is 37 kilometers. The height, height from sea level, it is 50 kilometers. Temperature at its top, it is zero degree. The atmospheric uh, pressure, it is one millibar. The uh, characters or the importance, it is called the ozonic atmospheric envelope. And it contains the ozone gas, okay? It contains the 20 kilometers uh, uh, ozone or the ozone layer. Uh, and the pilots prefer to fly in this layer because it, it doesn't contain any uh, turbulence or uh, it doesn't contain any weather turbulence. The third layer, mesosphere. Mesosphere, its uh, thickness is 35 kilometers and its height from sea level is 85 kilometers. Its temperature at its top, it is ni uh, negative 90 degree. The atmospheric pressure is 0.01 millibar, bar, and uh, from the importance or the characters of this layer, it is the coldest layer. It contains limited amount of helium and hydrogen gases. It can protect the Earth from the celestial uh, bodies or the celestial uh, uh, rocky masses like mete meteors and meteoroids coming from the outer space. It will protect the Earth. Okay, the last layer, which is uh, thermosphere. The thermo uh, thermosphere, its thickness is uh, 590 kilometers, and its height from the sea level is 675 kilometers. Its temperature at its top, it is uh, 1,200 degree, and the atmospheric pressure is 0 0.001 millibar. Its characters or its importance, it is the hottest layer, Okay, and its upper part contains ions, which is uh, called the, the ionosphere layer. Okay, and the ionosphere layer uh, contains all the wireless communications. Okay, here is about the atmospheric envelope or the atmospheric layers. Now, how can we calculate the change in temperature that occur in troposphere layer? We can use this rule. The amount of a change in temperature equal height above sea level times 6.5, okay? And to calculate the temperature at top of mountain or at foot of mountain, we can use this relation. The temperature at top of mountain equals to the temperature at foot minus the amount of decrease in temperature. Or if we want to calculate the temperature at the bottom or the foot of mountain, we will make the temperature at the top plus the amount of increase in the temperature. Let's see now how to answer this uh, problem. Find the temperature at point of height 10 kilometers above sea level if the temperature at foot is 24 degrees. So firstly, we will use this rule. The change in temperature, how can we calculate the change in temperature? 
So firstly here, the change in temperature. Let's calculate it. To be equals the height times 6.5. So the height equals the height here. It is 10 kilometers times 6.5. So the answer is 65 degree. Here is the change in temperature. Then we want to know the temperature at the top of the mountain or at this height, at 10 kilometers height. So we will use this rule. The temperature at the top of mountain equals temperature at foot minus the amount of decrease of temperature. So the temperature at the foot is 24. It is a given in the question here. Minus the uh, amount of decrease in temperature, it is equal to 65. 24 minus 65, it is equal to negative 41 degree. So the temperature at height 10 kilometers is negative 41 degree. Okay, it's complete. Okay, the ozone. What is the ozone and uh, what is the stru its structure, its thickness, its importance, the pollutants that cause to the ozone, what happens to the ozone? The ozone layer, its structure is composed of three oxygen atoms, okay? Its thickness, we said it before, its thickness is uh, 20 kilometers, from 20 kilometers to 40 kilometers. So the thickness is compressed into three millimeters, which is uh, the, the, natural, the natural degree of ozone or the measuring unit of ozone is 300 dobson, okay, by the scientist that made by the scientist dobson. Okay, importance of ozone layer. What is the importance of ozone layer? It acts as a protective shield for the living organisms against, against the harmful chemical effects of the UV radiations or the ultraviolet radiations. The ozone hole. What is the ozone hole? The ozone hole, it is thinning or losing parts of the ozone layer above the south, uh, south pole. Okay, the erosion that happens uh, in the south pole. Okay, the pollutants of ozone layer. What are the gases that cause pollution for the ozone layer or pollutant for the ozone layer? Number one, chlorofluorocarbon compounds or that we can call ferrium gas that we can use in the modern devices like the air conditioner, okay? This gas causes pollution for the ozone. Two, methyl bromide gas that we can use in the uh, uh, insecticides. Three, halons, the halons that we can use for uh, in the fire extinguishers. Four, nitrogen oxides. All of these gases cause uh, pollution for the ozone layer. Uh, then, how to protect the ozone layer? Number one, stop using the fluoro fluorochlorocarbon compounds or the filling gas and devices. Two, stop producing the ultrasound concord. Okay, here is the structure of ozone. Let's see the global warming. What is global warming phenomena? It is the continuous increase in the average temperature of the Earth's near the surface. Okay. Greenhouse effect. What is the greenhouse effect and the what, what are the greenhouse gases? Firstly, it is the greenhouse gases. Number one, carbon dioxide gas. Two, chlorofluorocarbon compounds. Methane gas, nitrous oxide, water vapor. All of these are called greenhouse gases. Okay, what is the reason of increasing carbon dioxide gas? What is the reason for increasing of carbon dioxide gas? Number one, fossil fuel burning. Two, cutting the trees. Three, forest fires. All of these can cause increasing in carbon dioxide percentage. Four, or the next point, the negative effects of global warming phenomena. What are the negative effects of the global warming? Number one, melting of the snow of the two poles. When the snow at the two poles melt, it will lead to two things. Number one, the coastal areas, all the coastal areas or areas or that are near to uh, the water resources will be destructed, okay? Two, the extinction of the polar animals because the pools or the two pools, uh, uh, in the two pools, the snow will melt. So all the animals that live in the two pools will extinct or they will die, okay? Like the polar pear, like the penguin, like the seals, all the animals that live in the uh, polar uh, or the two pools. Two, severe climatic changes. 
severe climatic changes, it occurs due to uh, the occurrence of the tropical hurricanes or the destructive floods or the drought waves or the forest fires. All of this can cause uh, climatic changes or the climatic changes will lead to the occurrence of these uh, things. Okay. So uh, here is about uh, lesson two, which is talking about erosion of ozone layer and global warming phenomena in the gases. Let's see the uh, last unit, which is talking about the fossils and the extinction. And we say in this unit, we will talk about fossils and the types of fossils and uh, the extinction and what is the extinction and the extinct animal, the endangered animal and the reasons of the extinction. Let's see now. What is the fossils? Fossils are traces and remains of old living organism that preserve it in sedimentary rocks. Okay, so we have a living organism and this living organism died and due to rapid burying in the sedimentary rocks, now we have a fossil for this living organism. Okay, we have two types for the fossils, traces and remains. What is the difference between trace and remains? The trace is the traces for a living organism or an old living organism that indicates its activity during its life. For example, the worms tunnels and dinosaurs footprints. The dinosaur's footprints happens during the life of the dinosaur. Okay, and after his death, now we have a, a piece of sedimentary rocks and a footprint of dinosaur copied on it or found on it. Okay. Okay, the remains. What is the remains? Remains is traces uh, that indicates the remains of a, a living organism or an old living uh, organism after its death. Okay, for example, we have remains of shark teeth and remains of dinosaur's skull. The dinosaur's skull or the shark teeth that uh, we found or uh, uh, remains of this uh, organism after this organism uh, died. Okay, the types of fossils. What are the types of fossils? Let's see. What are the types of fossils? Complete body fossil, it is number one. The cast, the mold, and petrified fossils. The types of fossils are four types according to their way of formation or way of preservation. Let's see the definition and examples for uh, the four types. Firstly, the complete body fossil. The complete body, body fossil is formed as uh, uh, we have a living organism or an old living organism died and it's uh, uh, buried rapidly in the snow as the mammoth or it uh, um, buried and buried in the uh, resinous matter that's secreted from pine trees like the amber fossils uh, for the insects okay so the snow or the resinous matter that's secreted from the trees preserve with this animal from decomposition so it's called complete body fossil a second type Cast. What is the cast? It is a replica that shows the external details of a skeleton for an old living organism, like cast of a fern or cast of fish. Mold. What is the mold? The mold, it shows the internal details, or it is the replica of the internal details of a skeleton of an old living organism, like ammonites fossil, like nomulites fossil, like trilobite fossil. Okay, petrified fossils. What is the petrified fossils? The petrified fossils are the minerals that replaces the organic matter of an old living organism part by part, leaving the shape without uh, changing. Okay, like dinosaurs' uh, tooth and like the uh, dinosaurs' egg, like the petrified wood. Okay, so here is the uh, types of fossils. What is the importance of fossils? why we can study the fossil or why we have the fossils. We can use the fossils for many things. Number one, to determine the age of the sedimentary rocks. We can use the fossils that buried in the sedimentary rocks to know the age of the rocks. Okay, so firstly, we can use the uh, uh, sediment, uh, we can use the fossils to determine the age of the sedimentary rocks. It is the first point. Two, Figuring out the paleo environment. What is figuring out the paleo environment? From the fossils that found in the rocks or found in the uh, water, uh, we can know the age of the rocks or the uh, the, um, the environment. Sorry, not the age. The environment of the uh, 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 this uh, this rocks. 
For example, the Nomulite fossil. Nomulite fossil found in limestone rocks in Mukatta mountain. So it indicates that this place or in Mukatta mountain uh, was a sea uh, floor area uh, more than 35 million years ago. Okay. Two, or letter B, ferns, uh, ferns fossil. Ferns fossil indicates the environment was hot and rainy tropical environment. Coral fossils. Coral fossils indicates that the environment was clear, warm, shallow sea. Okay, so again, it can show us the environment where this uh, uh, animals or this plants found in. Three, studying the life evolution. We can know the life evolution from the fossils too. So uh, through the fossil record, we can know the uh, uh, the plants that uh, uh, originated firstly or its grow firstly for example the algae the algae appeared before moses and ferns okay and the sperms and the sperms appeared before gymnosperms okay uh, the invertebrates the invertebrates appear appears for vertebrates for example uh, uh, the vertebrates that appeared firstly like fish it appeared in the water amphibians reptiles and birds and mammals they appeared uh, at the last or they appeared the last thing the archaeopatrix archaeopatrix is a link between reptiles and birds it is a, a note or uh, for your information the archaeopatrix is a link between reptiles and birds so again the life evolution through the life evolution or through the fossils we can know the life evolution as we say the algae appeared before moses and ferns the uh, uh, gemmosperms appeared before angiosperms and the invertebrates animals appeared before vertebrates okay okay for petroleum exploration what is petroleum exploration through the micro fossils uh, that we that found in the sedimentary rocks uh, we can know or we can indicate that this rocks uh, uh, contains petrol or uh, it's suitable conditions for petrol formation okay Okay, here is about the fossils, the last part or the last lesson, which is talking about the extinction. What is extinction? Extinction, uh, extinction is uh, the continuous decrease uh, of the species or the number of a species of a living organism without compensation of this uh, living organism until all the members of this species dies out. So they will extinct. Okay. Uh, what are the factors that causes the extinction of the animals? The extinction of the animals in the old ages and the extinction of the animals recently or in uh, in the recent ages. In the old ages, in the old ages, like the meteors that happens on the earth, like violent earth, uh, violent uh, earthquakes uh, or earth movement, uh, the glacial ages, the poisonous gases that emits from the volcanoes. All of these are the reasons that causes animals in the past to disappear. For example, the mammoth and dinosaurs. Okay, the factors that causes the extinction of the species recently. What causes the species recently to disappear? Number one, overhunting. Overhunting of the animals to, uh, to use it in the industry, for example, it causes the extinction of the species. Destroying of their, their natural habitats, the habitats where the, these animals live, they are, they are destroyed. Uh, the environmental pollution that happens uh, to their environments or to their habitats. The climatic changes and natural disasters, they are causes extinction of the animals. For example, about the animals that uh, recently ex uh, uh, extinct, uh, dodo bird and quagga. And from the endangered species, panda, rhinosaurs and papyrus plant, they are endangered species. species. Okay, let's complete. The effect of extinction on the ecological equilibrium. For sure, when uh, an, any animal uh, or any species disappear from the food chain, it will cause uh, 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 unbalance, uh, imbalance in the uh, uh, food chain. Okay, the decrease, the severe decrease, for example, in the uh, type of animals or type of species, or severe increase in type uh, of species, it will make ecological uh, 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 imbalance okay so what is the food chain and what is the food web the food chain it is the path of the energy that transmits from the living organism to another living organism in the ecosystem the food web it is a group of food chains connected to each others okay 
in the ecosystem we have simple ecosystem and complicated ecosystem what is the difference between simple ecosystem and complicated ecosystem in the simple ecosystem like the desert for example uh, uh, there are few members in this ecosystem so any change any change occurs to this ecosystem it will uh, strongly affect on the balance of the uh, of this ecosystem because there are uh, uh, few numbers or few uh, members in this ecosystem uh, the opposite for the complicated ecosystem for the complicated ecosystem like the forest uh, it contains multiple members and any uh, any change happens to this ecosystem it will not uh, strongly affect the members or the the ecosystem in uh, sorry the members in this ecosystem will not be affected like the simple ecosystem okay so here is the difference between the two types of ecosystems, the simple and complicated one. The ways to protect living organism from extinction, extinction. How can we protect the living organism from extinction? Number one, uh, putting rules, putting rules uh, to control the hunting in land, sea and air. We can put rules for uh, the persons who hunt uh, in desert, uh, in forests, for example, uh, to control the hunting process okay because as we say before from the uh, reasons uh, of extinction of the animals is over hunting okay two increasing the awareness about the importance of the natural life uh, to sustain the existence of the mankind three reproducing the endangered species and sending them back to their native habitats and making reproduction for the endangered species like the rhinosaurs to uh, reproduce again and to form a, a new individuals again. Four, establishing gene banks for those much endangered animals. And five, establishing the natural protectorate areas. Let's see what is uh, uh, the natural protectorate. The natural protectorate is a safe area established to protect the ind endangered species from extinction, okay? And the most uh, available or recognized protectorates are number one, the Yellowstone Protectorate in USA. It protects the gray bear, the Banda Protectorate in China, uh, Ras Muhammad Protectorate, it is in Egypt. Uh, Ras Muhammad Protectorate uh, contains uh, different types of uh, whales, uh, sorry, uh, it contains different types of uh, coral, uh, coral reefs. And Wadi al Hitan, it is also in Egypt in Al Fayyum, and it contains a complete uh, body fossil for a whale. Okay, here is the last part. Okay, here is uh, the end of our uh, lessons for the first term, and I uh, hope you um, I hope you are uh, good. And uh, now it's the the end and. Um, goodbye.